All right, so I, like I think we will go ahead and get started. I am anticipating that we'll continue to see people kind of filtering in for the next like five to 10 minutes, but we've got a good audience already. So, hey, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Emily with Likewise, and I'm really excited to be chatting with Emily Henry and Carly Fortune about their new books, which I think will be two of the summer's best beach reads. Uh, you probably are familiar with Emily Henry already. She's the number one New York Times bestselling author of People We Meet on Vacation and Beach Read, as well as several young adult novels. And her new book, Book Lovers, came out on Tuesday. So this is launch week for her. And... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Carly Fortune is an author and an award-winning journalist who's worked at The Globe and Mail and Toronto Life Magazine, among others. She was most recently the editor-in-chief of Refinery29. And her debut novel, Every Summer After, comes out next Tuesday, May 10th. So very excited for her also. And it's amazing. Thank I have read you. it. It is so good. And if you liked people we meet on vacation, you will love every summer after. Definitely agree. Um, we have, there are signed copies of both books available from Blue Willow Bookshop. So I'm going to put the links for that in the chat uh, down below. So first up is the link for book lovers, and then we'll do the link for every summer after. Um, I see some chat happening already, which is awesome. If you have questions... Uh, for Emily or for Carly or for both of them, feel free to drop those in the chat and I will try to just keep up with them and sprinkle them in as our conversation goes. So I thought we would start by just having you each tell us a little bit about the book. Emily, people may have read yours already. Carly, yours isn't out yet. Um, but in case people haven't read it, Emily, tell us a little bit about Book Lovers. Sure. Um, so Book Lovers is about Nora Stevens, who is an uptight ambitious, semi-cutthroat literary agent um, from New York City. And she is relatively happy with her life. She's got most of it down to a science, but she keeps getting dumped over and over again in this very weird, very specific scenario where her boyfriend, who should be perfect for her, goes out of town for work and meets someone else in like whatever small town he's sent to, um, who's Nora's polar opposite. And he dumps Nora and relocates and like changes his entire life, like goes from being like an investment banker to like helping run a family in or whatnot. Um, and so Nora feels like she has kind of been relegated to be like the villainess of other people's love stories. Like she is kind of the, the like bitchy city girlfriend um, who gets dumped partway through the movie for like the real love interest. And her younger sister Libby is like, you know what, you need to get out of town and, and try having your own transformational small town love story the way that all of your ex-boyfriends have, have done. And Nora's not super into that, but she wants to spend time with Libby. And so she agrees to go to small town North Carolina for a month with her and to complete this kind of like ridiculous small town trope um, bucket list. And while she's there, she keeps running into her nemesis from back in the city, Charlie Lastra, who is this um this kind of like prickly opinionated editor who she does not have a good relationship with and she's trying to kind of figure out like what he's doing here because it makes no sense really for either of them to be in this town excellent i think that's a great summary that leaves <laughs> a lot of the sort of little mysteries uh up for readers and it's so good yeah. Yeah. thank you and carly tell us about your book Sure. Uh, so Every Summer After is my debut novel. It is a sweeping love story about Percy and Sam, who meet as teenagers when Percy's parents buy the cottage next door to Sam's house on a lake in Barry's Bay. Um, but as adults, they haven't spoken in more than 10 years. Um, and the, the book kind of goes back and forth. It's told in alternating now and then timelines. So it's set over the course of six summers in the past where you see the two of them meet and become fast friends and best friends um, and fall in love. And one weekend in the present where Percy gets a call that has her rushing back to Barry's Bay and reuniting with Sam. Um, and it's a very tumultuous weekend. And the 
kind of whole time you're trying to figure out what it is that happened that caused the two of them to split apart. Because as you find through reading the past timeline, they are just like the most wonderful pair of best friends. Um, and that's, that's every summer after. Yeah, I think that also gives away yeah. just enough um, to entice readers, but doesn't doesn't tell too much of the the mystery that happens. So, Emily, can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration for Book Lovers and how the story evolved from that kind of initial spark to what it is today? Yeah, sure. So, Book Lovers started with me watching way too many Hallmark movies, which is probably like any more than like two. <laughs> but every winter, I like do go down that rabbit hole for several weeks where I'm just a machine that's just whole programming is devoted to seeing as many Hallmark Christmas movies as possible. And so because of that, I, you know, started to notice the trend of there oftentimes mm -hmm. being this storyline that's sort of the fish out of water, big city hotshot goes to the small town um, to do something like truly terrible. That's like, just, you know, fire everyone. Basically they're like, go to, go to small town Vermont and fire everyone. That's your job. Um, your job is you fire people. So when, when he goes to small town Vermont, of course he like will always meet someone else and he'll learn the, the true meaning of Christmas and he'll have a new purpose for his life. And, you know, in the end, he's going to give up, up his whole life back in the city and, and relocate and be with this new um, woman he's met. But throughout the first, like, half of the movie he still usually <laughs> has a girlfriend back in the city and I think you know the writers are doing that so that they can like have her call him and be like what are you doing why aren't you back here yet I don't get it you're changing you're changing um and, and also she's there to kind of be a foil to like the right woman for him and so like you just see how like callous and cold-hearted and work obsessed she is every time she's calling she's just like like getting Botox while working like on a treadmill <laughs> like she's like got it mm -hmm. all going on and being very like snippy to everyone um and I I just thought it was like funny that that kept happening over and over again and I was like instantly thought it would be really hilarious to write a story about a woman who just keeps being that woman <laughs> like she's like the same woman in every single mm -hmm. movie basically um and so that was the starting point. But then, like, pretty quickly after that, like, probably within minutes, I was thinking, well, also, like, we need some understanding of why this woman is like this. Because she really, she's calling this guy, and, you know, he's been sent there to, like, destroy a small Christmas tree farm that's been running for decades. And she, like, can't understand why he won't just do his job. It's like she has this mental block where she's like, you should be doing this. Why aren't you doing this? And to me, that's really fascinating because you know, the, the lazy thing to do is just say that character is evil and she, you know, she hates Christmas, <laughs> but like in <laughs> real life for someone to, to operate that way, they have to have a history and a context that's made them who they are and made them think how they think. And so I was really excited to take a character who has basically ever been only ever been like a villain or like a foil to the good, the good girl in, in movies and books and just give her the full story, you know, the full space of a story, not just to see, like, what her version of a happy ending would look like, but also to really dig into why she's that way to begin with. Um, and, yeah, it was, like, mm -hmm. instantly so fun and so clear. Like, we're just... I think Charlie took a lot more work, like developing him and developing a lot of the side characters took a lot more conscious thought and asking questions about them. But for Nora, I just felt like I immediately understand why someone would take their job this seriously. Like it, you know, I understand she must love her job. And I also understand she must have had, you know, financial instability growing up to, to really feel like she needs mm -hmm. something stable. And, um, you know, she's kind of the, she's kind of the woman who's like, like in in her mind not that her job is to fire anyone but like the first thing I knew about her is like if she's on the phone telling your boyfriend fire everyone and get back to the city it's because she's thinking those people are going to get fired whether you're the one to do it or not and you're also going to get fired if you don't do your job and it's kind of just like this mm -hmm. like this realist who just you know is is not um not to you know the quite as romantic or whimsical as 
a lot of um, romance heroines. Not that all of them are that, of course, that, you know, romance mm-hmm. is a hugely varied genre, but it was just really fun to take that specific plot line and world and justify like this character basically. Yeah. I love that. This book I think was your funniest you. because yeah, it just like the beginning, the opening chapter where you're kind of explaining that backstory. Mm-hmm. I was just laughing out loud because it is, you're just like, Oh man, she just <laughs> keeps getting dumped by like the guy who's going to destroy yeah. the, the family yeah. owned inn or whatever. Right. Right. And we're kind of rooting for that as the viewers, when you're watching that, you know, that kind of, of course, plot. you're like, yeah. that's what you're rooting for. But there is like a part of me that's like, that's not great. (laughs) Yeah. And, and Carly, how about you? Uh, What inspired every summer after and uh, how did it evolve from that initial inspiration? Um, So I always wanted to write a book. It was something that I had in the back of my head, um, but it was something I also never thought I would do. I've been um, an editor for 16 years And even as, you know, working in journalism and working for publications, I didn't write very much. Like it was something I kind of stayed away from. And then um, in the summer of 2020, I returned to my kind of hometown area. I grew up in Berry's Bay where the book is set um, on a dirt road in the bush uh, on a lake. And we, my husband, my son and I, during the pandemic, spent July and August on a lake near Barry's Bay. And I was feeling very nostalgic for my childhood summers on the lake. And I think the other thing that happened was that a couple, a couple months earlier, like very early into lockdown in March, I dug out a couple of shoe boxes from the back of my closet that had... Um, 13 journals that I had kept from age seven throughout university. And I, yeah, I hadn't, um, I hadn't read them as an adult. I had, uh, my parents sold our house on the lake over 10 years ago and I brought them home with me and just kind of shoved them in the closet. And that, that March I sat down and I read them all and they are, like stuffed like in the pages they're like stuffed with notes passed in class there is a letter that I had sent to my crush and never sent it um there was a letter Mm. from my best friend breaking up with me which was six pages um front and back (laughs) and and the, the the diaries were so um like it struck me reading them 20 years later, just how like raw everything felt to me and um, how, how tough it is to be a teenager and how much we kind of yearn for somebody, whether it's a platonic relationship or a romantic relationship, we really like yearn for somebody to be the person who understands us. And I felt like very alone as a teenager, even though I had a very tight circle of friends. Um, and I think that was all kind of in the back of my head. And then one day, so I was, um, the executive editor of Refinery 29 Canada, which was a wonderful job, but it was also a very stressful job. And I one day got off a very intense work call, um, where I wanted to kind of scream and pull out of my hair. I had been making like pro con lists of whether to quit or not. Um, and I said, that's it. I'm going to write a book. Like I haven't done any creative work for myself since I was in high school. Um, it's all been for companies that I've worked for and I need to do something for me. And so I didn't know what that book was, (laughs) but I think being in Barry's Bay and having read my journals kind of all played into it. And so I just, um, I I wanted to finish I'm very goal oriented so I was like I'm going to finish a draft by the end of the year and I calculated how many words I'd need to write a day in order to get an 80,000 word manuscript and it was 388 words and I thought that didn't seem like very much Um, I'm used to working with journalists who file like you know stories every day with original reporting I was like I can do 388 words um so I'd get up really early before work and before my kid had woken up and just kind of plug away at it and that's I kind of drafted it over four very kind of feverish months 
Um, and that that's every summer after. I love that. Um, so if you're just joining us, we're talking to Emily Henry and Carly Fortune about their new books, books Book Lovers and Every Summer After. And there's a great, a great question in the chat, which is, is there a trope you don't see yourself writing? And if so, how come? Emily, you take that first. <laughs> Am I muted? My, my little thing is not illuminating. You are not muted. Okay, we can good, hear good. you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. I'm like so new to this technology and all technology. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like I really, I mean, clearly I really love tropes. I stuff all of my books full of them. Um, and I'm always trying to like figure out, like, we love them for a reason. So it's like, I want to use them, but also in like their most realistic form. Um, as far as like romance tropes specifically, or like sub genres, I don't like, you know, I know like billionaire romance is a thing and that's not my thing I would have it's like I could write the sharky like mean executive woman and love her but I would have a harder time I think like just enjoying the fantasy of writing like a billionaire romance I'd be like he's bad <laughs> he's a bad guy um but other, I don't know I mean like I really I like all of them and usually it's like I'm choosing one because it sounds like a challenge like people we meet on vacation I'm not generally a huge friends to lovers reader and lover and um I just wanted to see if I could do that basically and for book lovers I knew that I wanted to have a leading couple who were very 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 similar and I was just kind of like okay that that sounds hard to me like it sounds hard to still have tension when two people are very similar um and that's like the source of of the angst between them rather than being totally different so that was super fun Oh, I love that, Emily, that your books are like a personal challenge. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's fun. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> you. I, I, it's like, I obviously want to give something specific to the readers, but also it's like, I'm spending every day, all day doing this. <laughs> like, yeah. I want to feel like I'm getting better. Yeah. Um, how about you, Carly? So I am kind of new to tropes. Um, it's not some, like, I was a romance reader. I kind of started reading romance in 2019 when I, I would say I discovered romance personally. Um, but the discussion around tropes is something that I'm kind of like coming into over the last year or so. And so I don't know that, like, I haven't seen any that I have, I have said, no, oh, gosh, no. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's so I, like, I agree with Emily. Like, I think anything can be, um, wonderful with the right kind of voice and care. Okay. So another great question from the chat. Um, someone says for a question for Emily, I couldn't stop wondering as I was reading book lovers, given that so much of the book is about the mechanics of writing a book, what was it like working on that book as a writer with your editor and being edited by your editor, but also embodying the perspectives of an agent and an editor who are working together <laughs> on a book? <laughs> yes. Um, it was really fun because I, so first of all, Carly and I have the same um, editor, which is like how we met and how I got to read her book so early and why I am just positive you will love her book if you haven't read it yet and you like mine. Um, yeah, it's Stop. true. But so yeah, my editor and agent, I love them both professionally and personally. And I trust them so much. It feels like this really rare, like symbiotic relationship where like, I like can't breathe without talking to that person at this point. I'm just like, let's get on the phone. I like can't even think of a single idea until I've talked to you, gotten your take. And I don't know. I just feel like we work so well together. And so as soon as I pitched this as a premise, like the way that I knew that it was the right idea is that they both like started laughing and I was like, okay, that's good. Like they, th you know, I thought it was funny, but sometimes I don't know <laughs> I am the only person who thinks something's funny. Actually, a lot of times I feel that way. So that was really, really helpful. But I will say there was, like, I was a little bit nerve wracked writing it because I knew, you know, I was going to be writing about these professions that I've not had. And like the first people reading them would be my editor and my agent. And actually um, my former agent, who is now just a full-time writer, um, Lana Harper, who was, um, 
witchy, like sexy romance novels also started coming out last year. Um, so she was my first agent and we're still close friends and, and she read it as well and was super helpful because she, you know, knows the ins and outs of agenting. So there's always that like embarrassing feeling of like, am I getting this right? But honestly, that's just being edited in general. It's like, I don't think of myself as having huge <laughs> imposter syndrome until I turn a book in and then I'm like, is this the time that they realize this has all been a huge joke and I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but it, was, yeah, it was like delightfully meta. They're, they're so smart and they were really able to push me to go further and deeper in everyone's psyches and um, give me smart notes about um, the industries. And yeah, they were, I mean, honestly, it was an ideal situation. I would have hated to be in that situation if it was my first book working with that specific team. That would have been so scary. So there are tons of great questions in the chat. Um, the next one is, where did you get the inspiration from for your characters? So let's have Carly answer this one. Sure. I don't know that I have a good answer, though. <laughs> um, I, you know, Percy um, just, kind of, I feel like they just kind of came to me, both both Percy and Sam. Like, um, I wanted to have Percy like really struggles with anxiety and that was something that was important to me. And I, I like, I, I don't know. I, and I honestly, like even the, the book I'm writing now, I don't know where they come from either. Um, the only, you know, I think when you like have your protagonist, you can kind of think about who her like ideal foil is yeah um so like once I had Percy it's like okay I want to give her like the like what is her ultimate best friend look like so that was like yeah. kind of ha like how I kind of start with her and then think about her mm -hmm. partner and like what it is that we're looking like I'm looking for in the story from that character and then you know, from there, like the secondary characters kind of come alive too. Like how, how like how are they kind of bugging our our protagonist and like um, or supporting or whatever their role is? Like my in this book, Sam has an older brother named Charlie who is just like such a delight to write because he's always he's just like such a bother to Sam. And um, <laughs> Percy's best friend Delilah is also like such a bother to her, and so it kind of like for me, I guess, spins from like the main character and what the the like what she needs and what the story needs from the the characters after that. Carly, that was a perfect answer. <laughs> that was a very good answer. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> So relatedly, do you have a favorite character in the book? Let's start with Emily and then we'll go back to Carly. Oh, um, I don't know if I do. I mean, I think I really loved Nora right from the beginning and I felt very protective of her from the beginning um, where I, you know, I was kind of worried like people wouldn't connect with her and it's been amazing how many people have just been tagging me and posting like, I am Nora. Um <laughs> And Emily, I wanted to ask you about that. Sorry to interrupt. No, go for it. Why were you worried? Why were you worried? Because I found her so tender and sweet and lovable. What was your worry? Well, thank you. But I think, I mean, I guess it's like, first of all, I'm writing and whenever I'm writing in first person, I do think I get like a little bit too close to my main characters. And so there's <laughs> like, it's almost like a, I don't know, like an unhealthy mother daughter relationship or something. Um, and I think I just was worried because it's like, I'm taking this character who is already perceived in this way. And I knew that the only way to like, I wanted that to still be on the page. I didn't want to just be like, I said I was this way, but I'm actually totally different. I, I wanted it to be clear why people think she is cold or rude or cutthroat or any of those things. But I also really wanted them to not think that she was like, I don't know, like an unlovable bad person. And I knew I just would have to go deep enough into her brain and her heart to do that. And I, I mean, I honestly, I do think Libby really helps her sister. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that character really helps because you do get to see the one person that Nora is like very soft with. Um, but also, you know, like she, mm -hmm. like a lot of Nora came from some of my favorite people and from myself too. people who 
I don't think necessarily come across that soft and who can be like, I don't think I'm intimidating, but my best friend is like terrifying to everyone. And I don't feel that way. And like, she's so kind and generous and whatever, (laughs) but she's not going to smile if she doesn't feel like smiling. She's not going to laugh if she doesn't think it's funny. I don't know. So I think I just felt like protective of that type of person. Mm -hmm. How about you, Carly? Do you have a favorite character in the book? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> probably like probably either Charlie or Delilah, just cause as I said before, they're like such, such a bother. And I find, um, characters who are behaving mischievously to be so fun to work with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's like what they bring out of the rest of your cast is, you know, it just is a delight. And I think, I think about that, um, I think it was Kazuo Ishiguro who wrote Never Let Me Go, who once talked about how he's not interested really in writing about characters so much as he is in writing about relationships. And that really stuck with me because it's like, it's it's Mm. specifically who this person is with this person and then with this person and then with this person. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I, I want to give a little shout out to Delilah because I felt like that character yeah. was surprising. Like when she's introduced, she's totally a middle school mean girl. And I sort of thought that she was going to be like a one off, <laughs> like there was going to be like this one thing with her. And then she keeps coming back and, and she turns out to be this really important friend. And I just really loved the evolution of that character. And I felt like there's kind of like, you're just very generous yeah. with her, you know, and you were just like, oh, she's a mean girl and she's gone. Oh, thank um, you. So, yeah, yeah, shout out to you Delilah. so much. I, ha- I had like, I didn't write it, but like I had initially thought, oh, like Delilah's gonna, like Percy's gonna really go through bad stuff all throughout school, and Delilah's gonna be a, a nemesis, like a nemesis. And then I was like, that's not yeah. really what I want to write, first of all, about friendship. But it's also, um, I, I just like in my own experiences <laughs> with young female friendships, they go through so many forms and. Also, so like some of my friends, uh, like our yeah. friendships started out like a little like skeptical of each other or wary of each other, even like you know mm-hmm. in our twenties, and it just that just felt more real to me. Yeah. All right. Um, another great question from the chat. Um, someone says, "I always hear about the lengthy process of querying, but it seems like it was actually pretty quick for you, Carly. Can you talk about that process? How many queries you sent, and the timing, and sort of going from having this manuscript that you wrote in four months to it being a finished book now?" <laughs> yes, I'll t- I'll I'll go through it as quickly as I'll. It's a pretty short story. So, um, I didn't know anything. I knew very little about publishing. A friend of mine is the people I know who have written books are journalists. And so a friend of mine who is a journalist, let me like have a chat with her agent and her agent was like, you know, I'd love to read it, read your book when it's done. And me not knowing anything about the querying process, which you typically, from what I understand, send your manuscript out to like a large large, maybe like 10 to 20, 20. Would that be right? Emily agents is, yeah, I mean, people do it in different ways, but yeah, I think I would usually send like five to ten at a time. Right. So you send you, you send your you figure out like your dream agents or the ideal agents for the project, and you set, send it out, and with a c- completed manuscript, which is also something I didn't really know until I was through the book. Um, and uh, I talked to this agent, and she w- wanted to read it. And when I finished the the draft, and I had sent it to beta readers, and um, so I sent it to her in December and then I posted on my Instagram that, you know, I set myself this goal and I had achieved it. I had sent it to an agent, one agent. And, um, and <laughs> then somebody on my Instagram commented and she was a woman who had been my first job out of school was as the University of Victoria um, there, they had a student paper and I was their editor in chief. So I I left Toronto and moved out to British Columbia for a year. And this woman who had been my arts editor reached out to me and she said, Hey, I'm a literary agent now. Could I see your manuscript? And I said, I don't know if I can send it to you because (laughs) I just sent it to someone else. And she was like, I said, what's kind of, is that okay? And she said, yes, here's what you do. And then my friend at that time kind of stepped in and said, Carly, I think you should talk to authors about how this works. 
because um, <laughs> it, like you're not kind of you know not taking yourself seriously and so I talked to a couple authors and they suggested querying a small group of agents so then I sent it out to maybe five agents um, including uh, my agent our agent Emily <laughs> Um, the best agent, many would say the best agent Taylor. And, um, I did, I did this in December, which is also the worst time to do this. I understand now. And for some (laughs) kind of like stroke of luck, Taylor checked her email and read it. And, um, I had had, I had got a couple of offers of representation and then she, yeah, she, she offered to represent me. So it was a very, lucky um don't do what I did kind of story but I I, (laughs) what I will say that was helpful is I was looking for names of agents in the in the acknowledgments of books I had read and I had read Taylor's name in several books including Beach Read um which I read that fall and uh then when I looked up Taylor and her other clients I was like oh my god it has it must be like she's the dream and when she when we had her she is. she is and when we had our fo- first phone call I was like legit crying <laughs> and try to keep it together um so that's how that worked that's a great story thank you um another question from the chat is hi I've read both book lovers and every summer after and both books are such a delight if if the books were turned into movies who would you pick to play your leads so Emily do you want to kick us off there oh my gosh Oh, I want to kick, kick us off by asking whoever wants to chime in in the chat with their suggestions, yes. because I never have a good answer for this. And, and I, yeah, it's funny because I basically always just fall back on like the people who like were heartthrobs to me like 10 years ago, which means they're like <laughs> approximately 20 years too old now to play these characters. Um, so yeah, I don't have a lot of great suggestions there I always just do say like when I'm asking readers for their input and when I'm when I am like talking to possible like you know film teams whatever I do not care whatsoever if if any of my books get made into films I do not care whatsoever if the character if the actors look how I describe the characters for me it is like 100% the vibe so yeah if you've read the book and you have thoughts feel free to put it in the chat and how about you, Carly? Do you have, do you have yeah. ideas? No, I, I have no answer for this. <laughs> I do like, I really, I'm the same in that. Like if I thought of actors, they would be far too right. old. <laughs> um, and I don't like have a sense. Like, you, I don't know if you're like this, Emily, I'd be curious to hear, but like, I, I, when you're thinking about, I mean, I don't really care, wouldn't care either about how they appeared in the film physically, but also when I'm writing, I have like only a vague sense of their physical appearance. Oh, totally. Yeah? Let me ask you this, Carly. Do you know exactly where everybody's refrigerators are? Oh yeah. 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 I, I've had this conversation, <laughs> like I realized a couple of years ago, oh, I'm never actually picturing my characters. I'm just giving like approximate little, like I'm like, they have this feature and that's all I can see like these features and then when I was thinking about it more I was like wait a second I know the full layout of every kitchen regardless of whether (laughs) anything ever happens in the kitchen oh my god yes (laughs) that's so weird that's so weird and then I was talking to Jasmine Guillory the other day and she said she is the same way she can picture she knows where the refrigerator is and every everything she writes like doesn't have to try the refrigerator might not get mentioned, but she still knows. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm, I'm going to use this as a party trick when I meet yes. authors now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm really curious if there's anyone who doesn't know where the fridge is now. <laughs> like, what does that say about us? <laughs> I feel like I'm expecting to see more love scenes set in kitchens. Oh, now yeah. that we have this knowledge <laughs> that everyone knows like the full kitchen layout. Um, yeah. Well, and actually in an unpublished thing that may or may not ever get published, I do actually have one kitchen love scene, but usually the kitchen is just not on the page. I just know. <laughs> we got to take advantage of that knowledge. And I know. <laughs> um, so some great suggestions, Blake Lively for Nora. Yes. Um, oh my gosh. I love Jean Page. Said, yes, absolutely. Okay, somebody said Anna de Armas, and I love her so much. And I also, I think I would love her as January because I think she's got that from Beach Read. She's got that, like, I don't know, windswept, 
like I don't know, doe-eyed beauty. I would love oh, yeah. for her to be in every movie. <laughs> every movie that exists. <laughs> um, yeah, some some excellent fan casting going in the comments. Um, so we don't have a ton more time. So if you have questions, be sure you get them in the chat now. Um, I have a couple of more. Um, my first one is, what's on your vacation to read list this summer? Since these are both summer vacation books. And where will you be reading it? Ooh, I gotta look around. <laughs> I prepared because I am a brown noser. Um, so I'm really I have three. Um, one is the No Show by Beth O'Leary because oh, it's I, so which good. Is out. Ah, I, it's out now. I haven't read it yet. I've loved all of her books so very much. Um, another is Ellen Hildebrand's new book, which is coming out June 14th, uh, Hotel Nantucket which is about, I like, I'm just such a big fan of her books at like Same. 28 summers. Just like, I love reading authors and Emily, you are one of these authors who make, make me go, Ugh, what do we even bother? This is so oh good. my gosh. Oh my gosh. That's so nice. <laughs> um, and Ellen is one of those authors. And then um, I, there's a book called a hundred other girls coming out July 26th. Yes. Yes, yes, by Iman Hariri Kia. And it is about um, a woman who, a young woman who becomes an assistant to a very bossy editor in chief of a magazine. And as somebody in media, that's like appeals to me so, <laughs> so much. And there is like, from the description, there are print versus digital wars, which is like basically from my life. And I'm so excited to read that book. Wow. Um, that is great. Thank you for listeners. We'll make a list of these and share it in the romance room after the event. So you don't have to try and keep track of them. So we'll put them all there. Um, so you can see what they are and save them. Emily, how about you? What's on your to read list this summer? I, so I just started reading a couple of days ago, Jasmine Guillory's new book by the book, which is like a contemporary, um, Beauty and the Beast retelling. Yes, very exciting. Yeah, it's one. just sweet and nice, and it honestly does kind of feel like Beauty and the Beast. Like, I don't know, it's got that charm. So I feel like that's the perfect vacation read, even though I'm not on vacation. I'm mm -hmm. also super excited to read Katie Catugno's Birds of California. Yes, me too. She's a phenomenal writer. Like, I ate up all of her YA, and now she finally has this love story set in like a post well it's it's about a former child actress i believe and it, it's like set in like the post me too um kind of moment in hollywood where like i think she's got some trauma she's working through and i love a drama i love a romance that has a ton of drama and like healing and all of that so i'm very excited for that awesome thank you all right um another question from the chat what do this book and characters mean to you at this point in your career? And I love this question because you guys are at such different points in your career. So Carly, let's go first. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> right now it means a lot. So my book comes out on Tuesday. Um, and right now this book means a lot of excitement and nerves and <laughs> dread. Um, but it's, uh, this book has been life changing for me, honestly, um, writing it was such a revelation. I always felt like I worked really hard in media to kind of work my way up. And I thought, um, I was starting to feel like I needed to leave for a lot of reasons. And I didn't know what to do next because I had kind of, you know, devoted my whole adulthood to this profession. Um, I went to journalism school and I, I, um, I just didn't know what was next for me. And it was very scary and, and something I talked to my therapist a lot about. And um, then writing this book, it just felt like it was such a revelation. Like it just felt like what I was meant to be doing. And I remember going on a walk through the bush and thinking if I, if in 10 years I could do this as my job, I would be such a happy person. And this, um, uh, like this happened a lot sooner for me that I'm, I get like I've been I've just finished yeah. the second draft of my second book and like I'm thinking about what comes next and it's just like you know it's been like totally life-changing um, and the characters are very um, 
you know, I don't know if the, the character, I think the character in my book that means the most is the setting um, of Barry's Bay, which is my hometown. And it is such a beautiful, it's a tiny town of 12, 1200 people in rural Ontario uh, in Canada and a lake town, a working class town as well. And um, it really is a love letter to that area. Oh, I love that answer. And Thank how about you, you Emily? Yeah. Well, first, I love Carly's answer, too. I feel like that's just what everybody needs to hear, because when you've invested so much time in something, it can feel so scary to, like, admit that you want something else. And I, yeah, that's such a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm so happy for you. And for everyone who gets to read your book. um, For me, this book, okay, so I feel like I was in a very similar place to Carly, like, three years ago when Beach Read came out, where I had had this YA career that was, like, you know, it was okay. It was hard in, in a lot of ways. Um, and Beach Read just like caught in the way that I had since learned every author dreams of. Like I, when you start publishing, like you don't really know how hard it's going to be and how painful and how much disappointment there is and how much rejection keeps coming at you and all of that. And I had really gotten to a place of peace with all of that where I was like, okay, I'm just a, a mid-list author. I've got like my little group of readers and I'm happy. And now I know that's what to expect. And, you know, my publisher is not going to send me on any tours and I'm not, you know, I, it was just a very different, a very different world. And I had gotten to the point of feeling content in that, which I am so grateful for, but it also made me like really well prepared. I think when Beach Read happened to think, okay, this is a fluke. Like <laughs> this is a one in a million book. It came out at the exact right moment. That's why so many people have found it. This is never going to happen again. And I remember telling like my entire publishing team over and over again, like, I'm so happy. I'm so grateful. Like you've done so much hard work. And just so you know, it's like, I'm not expecting this to happen again. And later my publicists were like, every time you said (laughs) that, we would get like a little bit mad because like we want it to happen again. And then um, <laughs> people we meet on vacation, you know, like book talk took that and ran with it. And so like, again, I was like, okay, this sucks because my expectations are getting higher and higher. And I'm trying to like, know that <laughs> I can be content with my life if like only 40 people are reading my books. Like I, I need that to be okay. But with, with book lovers, to me, what it really, like I, Beach Read did change my life, but book lovers, I just never expected people to still care. I really thought I happened to have one book that for whatever reason caught on at that moment. And I 0% expected to have two more books after that that anyone wanted to read. So I'm just, for me, this book is like truly humbling in a way that I've probably never been humbled before just to feel like what an honor to be here. Um, And it makes me really happy that it was with this, this set of characters who I think of as just like, I don't know, like as just people who, who are, you know, are are afraid that they're not palatable enough. I really love that. It's like connecting with readers who love romance, but haven't necessarily felt fully represented by it in not seeing someone who's like as neurotic and uptight as Nora. And also like, you know, not as so unemotional and like, doesn't want kids and all of that. So it's just all around incredible. Well, thank you for that. We, I think readers are so lucky uh, that both of you are writing. These books were so fun and so moving. I think I cried a little bit at both of them. So um, I hope everyone goes out and gets a copy. We have just, um, I think we'll do maybe one more question from the chat and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Let's see. So somebody says, Emily, one of the things I love in your books are the little references to your other books. How much do you think about where the characters from different books might interact? Do you leave it at the quick mention or do you have an idea of like other relationships or interactions in your head? Um, They say no spoilers, but thinking of the beach read mention in the bookstore and book lovers. Yeah. Well, if so, if you haven't already read, I did write an extended epilogue where there's like some minor crossover between the characters from all three of my first books so that um is on my website which i i think i'm like 80 percent sure is emilyhenrybooks.com um <laughs> if not i'm sorry for wherever i'm sending you so if you haven't read that it's okay, correct emily you. i just double thank you and you can sign up for my newsletter there because i will hardly ever be sending one out but if i ever have extra content i've written i will put it there um so i do think about how everybody would get along but i don't like 
really imagine a lot of scenarios that I would write about necessarily, but, you know, I didn't think I would ever write an extra epilogue to be treated. And when I sat down to do it, it was like the easiest thing I've ever written. So maybe there will be some more um, crossover potential. I'm definitely working on like reaching the Taylor Swift level of Easter eggs within my work and life. So that's like <laughs> in the next five years, hopefully I'll be like re- revealing covers on murals and stuff. <laughs> incredible I look forward to that Um, so we'll uh, wrap it up but thank you both so much for being with us today it was really fun to chat with you and um, hear a little bit more about these books thank you so much for having us yes thank you it's a pleasure and thanks to all the listeners who are joining in today. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to an upcoming event, not next week, but the following week. We're talking to Rebecca Ross about her new fantasy, A River Enchanted. It's on May 17th at 4 p.m. So keep an eye out for that and for other book events in Likewise. And go add book lovers and every summer after to your saves. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Bye.